Hey, family of grace, Pastor Chris here. Welcome to our online campus here at Grace Central Coast. We are a gospel-centered multi-campus church on the Central Coast of California, and we are all about helping people find and follow Jesus. If you're new here, welcome. We're so glad that you're here. You can click the I'm new button in the chat right now, or you can uh, go to the website, gracecentralcoast.org, click the I'm new button there. Or you can even email me, chris at gracecentralcoast.org. I'd love to know that I got to worship with you today. Uh, with that, we're going to kick our time off together today, actually with a new song. Before we do that, we're going to read from God's Word um, about what it means to sing joyfully to Him, what it means to praise our Lord, and then we're going to do just that. So let's read from Psalm 100 together. Make a joyful noise to the Lord, all the earth. Serve the Lord with gladness. Come into His presence with singing. Know that the Lord, He is God. It is he who made us and we are his. We are his people and the sheep of his pasture. Enter his gates with thanksgiving and his courts with praise. Give thanks to him, bless his name, for the Lord is good. His steadfast love endures forever and his faithfulness to all generations. Let's praise him now. We worship the God who is. We worship the God who is. 
thank you for being the God that's with us. We thank you for not being the God that created us and dropped us off to try to figure this out, but for being the God who chose to love and be with us intimately. We're saying those lines, you are here, you are holy. We're standing in your glory. It's so easy to remember that when we're worshiping with our church body um, all together, but it's not as easy always to remember that in our living room. And so, Lord, we acknowledge that right now. We humble ourselves and acknowledge that you are here and you are holy. You are working and you are moving. We're standing in your glory, even as we're trying to wrangle our kids and pay attention to an online service or as we're finishing up breakfast and coffee. Lord, we're still worshiping together as one body in one church here. We're worshiping you because you are holy. Amen. Good morning, Grace Central Coast. My name is Jess Jantos, and I'm the Women's Care Director here. We're now going to be stepping into a time of giving back. If you're new to Grace, we're not asking you to give, but if you call Grace Central Coast your home, there are three easy ways to give back, and you can find those on the screen. As many of you know, we're nearing the end of our Next Generosity Initiative. We are just four weeks away from our final sprint. May 23 marks the beginning of the last week to give towards next. We're running towards the finish line, and we're committed to finishing strong. By God's grace, we know we can reach our $9.4 million goal. Let's finish strong and sprint towards that finish line together. In preparation for the end, we've asked our church family to tell their own story of how Next has impacted their life, their relationship with the Lord, and their perspective on generosity. Today, we'll hear an audio recording from Andy Gibson from our Five Cities campus about how Next has influenced him and how the Lord has blessed him to be a blessing. Hi, Grace family. My name is Andy Gibson, and my wife and Jeanette and I attend the Five Cities campus of Grace Central Coast. Several years ago, there was a Building on the Legacy campaign here at Grace Church, and I remember committing to a goal and being unable to meet it. So as next came about, my wife and I were beginning to contemplate what number uh, we began to commit to for the next campaign. And uh, in a gathering with Ben, we were challenged to a uh, rather audacious number Uh, and a number where I actually looked at and thought, this dude is insane. And uh, we committed to 60% of that, which was a significant amount over our normal giving uh, in order to support some of the additional activity. Well, through my business, which has been phenomenally blessed by the Lord through this pandemic, uh, we were able to hit that 60% goal. And as we entered the new year and we saw the giving to date really closing in on that goal, we, we, we realized it's time to make that jump business is continuing to be blessed, we can hit that crazy audacious goal that that we thought Ben was crazy for challenging us to uh, just two and a half short years ago. Looking at how Grace has stepped out in faith and looking at how that giving to date number is over $8 million, approaching the $9.4 million goal, how could I not be encouraged to stretch myself more to, to further help Grace Central Coast meet its objective of not just next, but further its objective of spreading the gospel on the Central Coast? Praise God for Andy's story of how God blessed him to generously give and help us close the gap to our $9.4 million goal. I hope you're as encouraged as I am today. Let's pray together for this time of giving back. Lord, all that we give you uh, was yours to begin with. Lord, we thank you for blessing us so that we can be a blessing to those around us. We pray for um, the ministries of Grace Central Coast as we aim to help people find and follow Jesus, not just here on the Central Coast, but around the world. Um, So bless these gifts. We pray that you would um, bless this time as we head into our message. Please uh, speak through Pastor Tim as he opens your word. Let us um, hear the truth that you have to teach us today. We thank you for all that you give us. In your name we pray. Amen. So now we're going to open our Bibles to Numbers 11, and we'll be reading verses 1 through 15. And the people complained in the hearing of the Lord about their misfortunes. And when the Lord heard it, his anger was kindled, and the fire of the Lord burned among them and consumed some outlying parts of the camp. Then the people cried out to Moses, and Moses prayed to the Lord, and the fire died down. So the name of the place was Tibera, because the fire of the Lord burned among them. 
Now the rabble that was among them had a strong craving, and the people of Israel also wept and said, Oh, that we had meat to eat. We remember the fish we ate in Egypt that cost nothing, the cucumbers and the melons, the leeks, the onions, and the garlic. But now our strength is dried up, and there is nothing at all but this manna to look at. Now this manna was like coriander seed, and its appearance like that of delium. The people went about and gathered it and ground it in hand mills or beat it in mortars and boiled it in pots and made cakes of it. And the taste of it was like the taste of cakes baked with oil. When the dew fell upon the camp in the night, the manna fell with it. Moses heard the people weeping throughout their clans, everyone at the door of his tent. And the anger of the Lord blazed hotly, and Moses was displeased. Moses said to the Lord, Why have you dealt ill with your servant? And why have I not found favor in your sight that you lay the burden of all this people on me? Did I conceive all this people? Did I give birth, give them birth that you should say to me, carry them in your bosom as a nurse carries a nursing child to the land that you swore to give their fathers? Where am I to get meat to give all this people? For they weep before me and say, give us meat that we may eat. I am not able to carry all this people alone. The burden is too heavy for me. If you will treat me like this, kill me at once, if I find favor in your sight, that I might not see my wretchedness. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Thanks, Jess. Well, just like the nation of Israel in the Old Testament, Jesus, our true and better Moses, is leading us, God's people today, those who trust Jesus, to a promised land. But the journey is a trek through the wilderness of life. The question is, will we trust God along the way? 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 11, speaking of Israel's wilderness wandering, says this, Now these things happen to them as an example, but they were written down for our instruction. So today, as we continue our Life of Moses series, let's see what we can learn from Israel's example as we look at Moses and the rebellion of the people. Welcome today. Thank you so much for worshiping with us at Grace Central Coast. If you're worshiping with us at 9 a.m. on Sunday morning, we want to invite you to say hi in the live chat at our website at gracecentralcoast.org. And today, to get things started in the chat, why don't you say good morning and share how long you've been connecting here at Grace Central Coast. We've got people who have been worshiping with us just a few weeks. We've got people who have been worshiping with us for decades. And so why don't you share that in the chat uh, this morning? As you're doing that, make sure you've got a Bible open with me to the book of Numbers, chapter 11. Grab that outline by clicking the notes tab just below the chat window. I was reminded again this week that there's so much more going on in the Bible than initially meets the eye at first glance. And the longer we look, the more that we see. The deeper we study, the more rich and beautiful it gets. I've been studying and teaching the Bible for the great majority of my adult adult life, but every single week, I learn new things. After nearly 30 years of teaching the Bible, I feel like I'm really just getting started. The longer I study the Bible, the more convinced I am of its divine authorship, its inerrant truth, and its exquisite design. So today, let me show you something new that I've learned just this week right here in the book of Numbers. The book of Numbers is named Numbers because the first three chapters, uh, there's a lot going on. There's a lot of, you guessed it, there's a lot of numbers. And Moses is commanded by God take, to take a census of the people of Israel. And so th- there's all this census information, all these numbers. But the book of Numbers is about so much more than numbers. Remember, the book of Exodus covers the movement of God's people from their slavery in Egypt to Mount Sinai, the mountain of God. And there they camp at Mount Sinai for just over a year. Numbers picks up right here, and Numbers covers the movement of God's people from Mount Sinai right to the edge of the promised land. And the book of Numbers covers a span of 39 years. So there's a lot that's happening across the book of Numbers. But the movement in the book of Numbers doesn't begin until the middle of chapter 10. Everything before that point 
is details and preparation. But when the nation of Israel finally does begin to move, that's when the trouble starts again. Here's what I discovered. Numbers chapters 11 through 21 contain a total of seven seven different rebellion stories. And while each of these stories contain important lessons and truths, each one of them by themselves, the way that these stories fit together makes it clear that these stories are meant to be considered as a unit, as, as a whole. They're meant to be considered together. As a whole, these rebellion stories are intended to teach us some things. So I put together a chart to help us see how these seven rebellion stories are related to one another and how they fit together to form what scholars refer to as a chiastic structure. So take a look. And so we, what we have here is like an A, B, C, D, C, B, A structure. And so what this means is that the first and the seventh stories are related to one another. And they both describe incidents of general rebellion. And then we see that the second, the B stories, are similar in that they are both complaints about God's provision or lack of provision. Uh, The second story is a complaint about manna and the people's craving for meat. And then the sixth is a complaint about a thirst for water. The third and the fifth C stories are connected as complaints against leadership. The third is a complaint about Moses and his Cushite wife. And there are likely racial undertones in this uh, story. And then, uh, and the complaint is made by Moses' siblings, Aaron and Miriam. And then the fifth story is a complaint against Aaron by uh, a man named Korah and some of his cronies about Aaron's exclusive high priesthood. And then right in the middle, at the very heart and center of these seven rebellion stories, is the story of the ten unfaithful spies who influence God's people to refuse to enter the promised land. They come back from uh, spying out the promised land and they give a bad report. And so God's people, they shrink back in fear and they refuse to enter the promised land. This story is the ultimate rebellion right at the center of all seven. In each of the seven rebellion stories, we see both a judgment response on the part of God and then an intercessory response on the part of Moses and or Aaron. Now, just look at that. Isn't that amazing? I had no idea. And I think that that is so awesome. Well, in the next few weeks, we're going to look at more closely at uh, each, uh, not all of them, but several of these specific rebellion stories. But today, I want us to think about them together. And I want to think about some lessons that the whole of them teach us. Because remember, you and I are on a wilderness exodus too. Remember, 1 Corinthians 10, 11. Now these things happened to them as an example, but they were written down for our instruction. So today, let's learn seven spiritual lessons from seven rebellion stories across these chapters, Numbers 11 through 21. If you haven't yet, make sure you grab that outline, follow along, take some notes, because we're going to go fast, and here's lesson number one. Our journey through the wilderness is long and hard before we reach the promised land. As soon as God leads his people onward, after this year-long stop at Mount Sinai, God's people, they start complaining. Because the journey really is long. The journey really is hard. It's unpleasant. And in many ways, it's miserable and it's full of trials. And this, I was just thinking about it, this is by God's design. God could have made the journey through the wilderness short. He could have made it easy. But God doesn't. What's he doing? God is testing and humbling his people. Uh, Do you remember, look at this, Deuteronomy 8, verse 2 says this, And you shall remember the whole way that the Lord your God has led you these 40 years in the wilderness, that he might humble you, testing you to know what was in your heart, whether you would keep his commandments or not. And what God is doing with them, God is doing with us. 
This life, this earthly life is long and it's hard. It's full of various trials. And this is by God's design. God could have made our walk through this wilderness life easy, but God doesn't. In one sense, all this earthly life is a wilderness of sorts. And yet, every one of us also experiences seasons in the wilderness, when the trials and testing of our lives seem especially acute. Here's the reality. Your wilderness is different than my wilderness, and all our wilderness journeys are different. But God's purpose is the same no matter what we're experiencing experiencing in our wilderness, no matter what our wilderness looks like. What is God doing? Well, just like with Israel, God is humbling us and teaching us to trust him. God is testing us to see what's in our hearts and to see if we'll keep his commandments. God is testing our faith and growing our faith. Know this, expect this, understand this and embrace this. Could this even be at least a partial answer to so many of our why questions? We ask, why is this happening? Why is God allowing this? Is not part of the answer always the same? Why is God allowing us to humble us and to grow our faith? Whatever else God might be doing, and he's always doing 10,000 things, we know that he's at least doing this. He's testing our faith to grow our faith. Well, here's lesson number two. I told you we were going to go fast. Change is often a catalyst for complaining. The people of God had settled into life there uh, at the foot of Mount Sinai. They'd figured it out and they'd gotten comfortable. This was their new normal. And they had really just settled in. They had established routines and found their groove. And they were pretty much obeying the Lord. They were building that tabernacle that God had designed and told them to build. They were offering sacrifices. They were living life in this new covenant relationship with God. But then when God tells them to break camp and start moving again, everything changes. And the change in their circumstances triggers a change in their hearts. And almost immediately the complaining starts. They set out in Numbers chapter 10, verse 11, and by Numbers chapter 11, verse 1, they're complaining already. Take a look. Numbers chapter 11, verse 1. And the people complained in the hearing of the Lord about their misfortunes. And when the Lord heard it, his anger was kindled and the fire of the Lord burned among them and consumed some outlying parts of the camp. I've seen it too many times among the people of God, our tendency to settle in and nest and get comfortable and secure right where we're at. We like things locked down. We like things predictable. And when they're not, when unexpected changes happen in our lives, in our families, in the church, in the broader community, or even in our country, we're apt to start complaining. I wonder, do you recognize this in yourself? I see it in myself. But here's the thing. Here's the reality. God loves us right where we are, but he never leaves us there. The life that God intends for his people is never static. The life that God intends for his people, it's always dynamic because God is committed to growth and change. And just like the muscles in our bodies, we grow through stretching. This life is our exodus. God is leading us to the promised land and we aren't there yet. Constant movement and constant change are inevitable until we arrive there. Knowing this and knowing our hearts can help us avoid the natural human tendency to complain. Because, le because of lesson number three, don't miss it. There are lots of ways to complain and rebel against God, but God doesn't seem to like any of them. That may sound super obvious, but I thought it was worth stating. If you read these seven rebellion stories in one sitting, you'll really see it. God does not take kindly to the complaining and rebellion of his people. He doesn't like it one bit. The people of God, they complain about the food they eat and the food they don't get to eat. They complain about the food that they miss back in Egypt. They complain about their leaders. 
the, their leader's apparent privilege and their leader's perceived incompetency. They complain about the seeming impossibility of conquering the promised land, about its big inhabitants and the many inhabitants and their fortified city walls. They, they complain about their thirst. They complain about their hardships and how long this journey is and how hard this journey is. And when they complain, God disciplines his people just about every time. So I, I was thinking about this. Is it wrong to acknowledge that things are hard in our lives? Is it wrong to be honest and real with God and to cry out to him? No, I don't think that's wrong at all. I think that's what we see in David and the Psalms. I think God wants us to cry out to him. I think God wants us to be real and honest with him. But I think that there's a subtle but important difference between David and Israel in the wilderness. And it's this spirit of rebellion. We see it, for example, in Numbers eleven eighteen. The people are crying out for meat to eat. And here's what God says. Numbers chapter 11, verse 18. It says this. Who will give us meat to eat? For it was better for us in Egypt. Therefore, the Lord will give you meat and you shall eat. You shall not just eat one day or two days or five days or 10 days or 20 days, but a whole month. Listen to this until it comes out at your nostrils and becomes loathsome to you. Here's what I want you to wanted you to see because you have rejected the Lord who is among you and have wept before him saying, why did we come out of Egypt? You see, the people of Israel, they've rejected the Lord. David never rejects the Lord, even in his hardest circumstances, even when David is being most honest and real, even when David is asking why David is still clinging to the Lord. David is still trusting the Lord. Do you see the difference? They want to go back to Egypt. That's a rejection of God. They want to go back to their slavery. Isn't that nuts? So what about you and me? In our realness and honesty before God, do we cling to him or do we rebel against him? Do we reject him? Here's the reality. Lesson number four. Our human hearts are so fickle and they're so forgetful. I don't know about you, but I often think, if God showed up in my life in some dramatic, clear, and undeniable way, unmistakable way, that would do it for me. That would settle my fickle heart once and for all. But it's not true. Look at Israel. They had seen, they had experienced miracle after miracle after miracle in the 10 plagues. God had led them through the dry ground of the Red Sea with water on the sides, right? God had provided manna bread from heaven for every day of the week. They had enjoyed water from the rock. God had met them at the mountain. God had pledged himself to this people. He'd given them his law etched on tablets of stone by his own finger. God's glory presence was among them, a cloud by day and a fire by night. They're hovering over the tabernacle. God had met them. God had provided for his people in every way. But it wasn't enough. Their hearts were still fickle. Their hearts were still forgetful. The next time a need arises and the needs are real, instead of turning to the Lord and humbly seeking him, that's what they could have done. That's what they should have done. But instead, every time they melt down, they freak out, they assume the worst and they question God's care and ability to provide. What about us? Our needs are God-given opportunities to humbly seek the Lord and then watch him provide. Is that the way you see your needs? Is that the way you respond to your needs? If God doesn't give you that thing that you think you need, then the reality is you don't need it. Here's lesson number five. The sin underneath the sin of rebellion is distrust. 
there is often a sin underneath our sins. There's often a deeper sin underneath a presenting surface sin. And I think that we see that here. The presenting sin, the surface sin of Israel here is the complaining. But as we've mentioned, the complaining is really a form of rebelling. But underneath the rebellion, there's an even deeper sin, the sin of distrust or faithlessness. So picture it like this. Here's the surface sin complaining. Underneath complaining is this rebellion. But even deeper still underneath the rebellion is a distrust and faithfulness. And this is made apparent in that center ultimate rebellion story at the center of the set when the 10 spies give this bad report and then Israel refuses to enter the promised land. We're going to look at it in detail next week. But today, I just want you to see Numbers 14, verse 26. Here's what it says. How long will this people despise me and how long will they not believe in me in spite of all the signs that I have done among them? Then verse 33 says this, and your children shall be shepherds in the wilderness 40 years and shall suffer for your, notice it, faithlessness until the last of your dead bodies lies in the wilderness. That's it. There is often a a sin that's deeper. The center, the ultimate story of rebellion is highlighting what is true in ever, every rebellion story. The sin underneath Israel's sin is the sin of distrust, faithlessness. And I think that it's often the deeper sin under our surface sins too. Why are we angry and frustrated? Why are we depressed and despondent? Why do we act in certain unhealthy and sinful ways. It's often because underneath, it's often because the sin underneath our surface sins, we're not trusting the Lord. Give it some thought. We got to keep moving. Here's lesson number six. Rebellion kindles God's wrath and judgment, but humble intercession draws out God's grace and steadfast love. So this is the pattern. I want you to see it here. Take a look. First, you know, we see it throughout these rebellion stories. Israel rebels. God judges and disciplines. Moses intercedes. And then God shows grace. Two things really strike me here. First is the power of humble intercessory prayer. When we come to God humbly, God responds. God can't help but respond. Because remember who he is. Remember what we've learned in our series. Remember Exodus 32. Yahweh, Yahweh, a God compassionate and gracious, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love and faithfulness. Yes, our sin is an affront to a holy God. Yes, God responds to sin with discipline and judgment. But humility, humility is the key that unlocks and unleashes God's compassion and graciousness. God's compassion and graciousness for ourselves and for others. Remember that. Don't ever forget that. When you are far away from God, humility is the key. When you're feeling God's discipline and God's judgment, humility is the key that unlocks God's grace and his love. Second thing that strikes me here is the power of one. The people across these stories, the people, the nation, really, they, they rarely repent themselves. But Moses pleads their case before God anyway. And God is gracious to all the people for the sake of Moses, because of the one, because of Moses' mediation. It's never stated, but I think it's definitely implied. Moses' humility and Moses' righteousness is put on all the rest of the people. It's credited to their account. The people are accounted as righteous on the basis of Moses' righteousness. It's really astounding. What a beautiful picture of the gospel this is. This is exactly how the gospel works. Jesus is our true and better Moses. Jesus is our intercessor. Jesus is our mediator. We aren't righteous, but he is. 
And so Jesus' righteousness is credited to our account. God sees us as righteous, not because we are, but because he is. This is the gospel power of one. And we see it so clearly here across these rebellion stories. Well, we got to get to the seventh and the last lesson because it's the best one of all. Though we are so often faithless, God is always faithful to his promises and his purposes. I mean, let's be frank. Let's be honest. Thousands of people die across these rebellion stories at the hands of God's judgment. And in the end, a whole generation dies in the wilderness as God gives them what they want. They don't want to enter the promised land. And so they won't. They will all die in the wilderness, a whole generation. But we know that's not the end of the story. God is disciplining his people. And sometimes that discipline is even unto death for some. But God will not consume all Israel. God is going to raise up a new generation. And we see that God is playing a long game of redemption. And his plan and purpose is to bring salvation, not just to Israel, but also through Israel to the whole world. And that's Jesus. And so though they, God's people here in the wilderness, reject him, he will not reject them. Though the people are faithless, God will remain faithful to his people, to his promises, and to his purposes. And this truth is demonstrated in such a unique and powerful way in the book of Numbers. I want to show you. Immediately after these seven stories of rebellion in Numbers 11 through 21 comes a super strange story of Balak, the king of Moab, and Balaam, a prophet of Moab. And so I'm going to tell you the story. Here's what happens. As Israel nears the promised land, they come and they camp on the plain of Moab. And Balak, the king of Moab, sees the people coming and he sees them camped on the plain and he sees a threat, understandably so. The horde of God's people has come upon him and he's heard about their reputation. He's heard about their exodus from Egypt. And so Balak summons the hotshot prophet of the land, a man by the name of Balaam, and he hires him. And he commands Balaam to curse Israel. And Balak tries to do it. He tries to curse Israel four different times. But every time that Balaam opens his mouth to curse Israel, Balaam blesses Israel instead. And this is what God says to Balaam, the prophet, at one point. He says this, you shall not curse the people. He's talking about Israel. For they are blessed. And so Balaam, against his own will and against the king's wishes, he can't help it. He blesses Israel again and again and again. And the king of Moab is ticked. And it's kind of a funny story. You can read it for yourself in Numbers 22 through 25. But do you see what a beautiful picture this is? While the people of God are down there on the plain of Moab, complaining and rebelling again and again and again, up above in the mountains is God, through Balaam, blessing the people. Despite all of Israel's rebellion, despite these seven stories of rebellion, despite all their rejection of God, all their distrust and faithlessness, God is still faithful to bless his people. God is still faithful to his promises. God is still faithful to his salvation long game purposes. And you know what? The same is true for you and I. The Bible teaches us and really the story of the Exodus teaches us that he who began a good work in us, he'll be faithful to complete it. God who has saved us by grace He will lead us to his promised land so that in the ages to come, he might show the immeasurable riches of his grace and kindness toward us in Christ. Though we are so often faithless, God remains faithful. Do you know it today? 
quick, before we pray and before we go, two things. Right now, share in the chat which of the seven lessons from the seven rebellion stories mo most spoke to you today? Which one grabbed you today? Which one jumped out at you today? Which one of these seven lessons did you need to hear today? And then a next step for this week. Spend some time this week determining where in your wilderness journey you're struggling to trust God. Okay, so remember, like the Exodus is all about learning to trust God. That's what God's doing across our wilderness journey. So where in your wilderness journey right now are you struggling to trust God? What does it look like to trust God in this circumstance in which you find yourself? What does it look like to distrust God in this circumstance? Why is it hard? to trust God in this circumstance right now. So you're really just thinking about this issue of trust, where you're at in your wilderness wandering and how God is calling you to trust him. And you're just dissecting that a little bit. I hope that you'll take that next step this week. Hey, let's pray together. Lord, we thank you for your grace and kindness in Christ. We thank you that the story of the Exodus reminds us of the gospel in so many ways. We thank you that you're faithful and we see your faithfulness to your people, to your promises and to your purposes across the ages. And you're, you're faithful for us too. You're faithful to us too. Help us know that. Help us believe that. Assure us of that. Uh, we don't want to be a complaining, rebelling, you know, faithless people. And so would you grow our faith? Would this story of the Exodus, might it serve as an example for us? And might it instruct us? May we learn uh, from your people in the Old Testament. We fix our eyes on Jesus, uh, the power of one, the one who, because he was righteous, we're righteous in your sight. Our hope is in him. And we thank you that you're going to get us all the way there to that promised land. Uh, we put our trust in you again today. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Hey, thank you so much for worshiping with us. We're so glad that you're here. We hope to see you again next week. And uh, Pastor Chris, what's up? Hey, thank you so much, uh, Pastor Tim. Uh, before we go here today, so glad I got to worship with you all. Again, if you're new, have any questions or uh, anything, just want to talk or be prayed over, uh, you can email me, chris at gracecentralcoast.org. I'd love to chat with you. Also, before we go, I wanted to let you know, I wanted to say a special congratulations to the Judkins family on the birth of their daughter, Charlotte. She arrived uh, about a week ago, weighing in at eight pounds, eight ounces, 20 and a half inches long. So, so excited for you, Judkin family, and so excited for our church family. With that, why don't you all stand wherever you're at? Uh, let's read with and to each other God's word of, as we send each other off today. Our soul waits for the Lord. He is our help and our shield, for our heart is glad in him, because we trust in his holy name. Let your steadfast love, O Lord, be upon us, even as we hope in you. Have a great week. Hi kids, I am Marina, Early Childhood Coordinator at Grace Central Coast, San Luis Obispo Campus. Today, we're gonna sing some songs, watch a Bible story video, and hear questions from kids. Ready? Let's get started. Hey kids, and welcome to Sing Along Songs, the part of the show where you sing along while we sing a song. I'm joined today by one of Mufasa's relatives, Dean. How's it going, Dean? How's it going, bud? Ow! Hey, I need those. All right, you ready? Here we go. When you're down and you're feeling blue, there's only one thing that you can do. It's in the freezer and it starts out cold, but pop it in the toaster and you'll see it glow. It's not a fork or a cantaloupe. It's a frozen waffle. It only stays frozen until you toast it. It's a frozen waffle. We've got a lot of time, so let's make the most of it by eating frozen waffles. Warmed up waffles would be fine too. It's a frozen waffle. So many places for the syrup to go. That's how you know that it's a frozen waffle. Only stays frozen until you.
wrote a letter to the church at Corinth. Years after Paul helped start the church in Corinth, the believers there were facing problems. One problem was that the church was divided. The people did not always get along or agree about what was most important. The believers met in small groups and had different leaders. Some groups were arguing that their leaders were better than others. One person would say, I belong to Paul. Another would say, I belong to Apollos or I belong to Peter, or I belong to Christ. Paul wanted this to stop. Is Christ divided? Paul asked. Of course not. Jesus came to bring people together as one body, brothers and sisters in God's family. Christians should not fight about which human leader has the most wisdom or strength. What is most important is the gospel. Paul said, hmm? the word of the cross is hmm. foolishness to those who are perishing, but it is the power of God to us who are being saved. God uses what seems foolish to the world, that is God, the Son giving up his life for us, in order to bring salvation to the world. Paul also reminded the church that believers cannot boast about themselves or other people. No human is as wise or powerful as God. When Paul preached, he didn't use fancy words so that people would think he was smart. He simply shared the good news about Jesus. Everyone in the church is united around Jesus, who died on the cross for our sins. He is God's wisdom and power. When we remember the gospel, we can live in unity with others. Other things, like immaturity and foolishness, cause division in the church. Paul wrote his letter to help the believers in Corinth. He told them many things about how to follow Jesus. Believers should live in such a way that people see them and know they belong to Jesus. Paul told the believers in the Corinthian church to come together because of the gospel. He reminded them that Jesus saves sinners. Because of Jesus and what he has done, believers can humbly come together as one body. Hey there, I'm Pastor Brian and it's time for questions from kids. Rachel from Logansport, Indiana asks, Another girl at my school is a Christian too, but we don't get along. What should I do? You know, as we answer this question, I, I think it's really helpful to think about why we get along with certain people and we don't with others. You know, one of the things is, is a lot of times we're drawn to people who are like us. They share similar interests, so maybe it's a sport. And if two people play the same game, say soccer, you're gonna be drawn together because you have that in common or some other hobby. Maybe it's going to the same school, uh, being in the same class, living in the same neighborhood. There's so many different things that connect us. And so a lot of times, if somebody has that in common, we're drawn to them. And if somebody doesn't, we're not as drawn to them. So here's the thing, when you think about it, this friend of yours in school, Rachel, who you don't necessarily get along with, you share the most important thing in common, and that's Jesus. So I'd encourage you to do this. I would encourage you to focus on that in your friendship. Talk about where you guys go to church. Talk about your favorite Bible stories. Talk about Jesus. Talk about challenges you have of, of living for Him. And I think if you start to do that, it may feel weird at first, uh, uncomfortable, but if you start to do that and you start to see you have this most important thing in common, I wouldn't be surprised if you started becoming good friends. But here's the other thing. It's even okay if you never become good friends. Uh, again, we can't be friends with everybody. As long as you guys are not unkind to one another, uh, as long as you're not adversarial, that's okay. You don't have to be best friends. And so if you try this and, and you just guys are just acquaintances from this point forward, that's okay. But I would encourage you, try to connect with that person. Uh, try to become friends because especially in a school environment, Anytime we have the opportunity to be friends with another person who believes in Jesus Christ, that is so, so helpful. So I'd encourage you, give it your best effort, trust in God, see what he might do, and see he might grow a great friendship for you with this other girl at school. So here's a question back for you. 
What are some ways you can show love like Jesus with anyone that you know? It feels like you always talk over me when I'm I trying just to want say a clear something. answer. It seems like are you ready to I'm close just, out this episode? I'm trying to say yes, but yes. Well, that's so hard. Let's sing Proverbs 3, 5, and 6 as we always do. And how should we sing it this time? You know what? We have some pretty great voices, I think. Um, mm -hmm. But there's some people out there, about 50% of the population, that tend to have better voices than guys like us. You're saying that we should sing it like girls. I think, yeah. All right, let's give it a go. Let's do it. Ready, set. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Be not of your own understanding. Acknowledge Him, and He will direct your life. Beautiful. So wonderful. See you next time. Bye. We are so glad you joined us here today. I am Marina, Early Childhood Coordinator at Grace Central Coast San Luis Obispo Campus. Our kids ministry team is committed to bringing the good news of the gospel into your homes and helping you disciple your kids. For more information or resources or to contact us, go to gracecentralcoast.org. See you next week. <laughs>